God's mission is everything, or is it? This is very fundamental when we talk about mission, and that is the whole concept of doing mission without gospel. J.D. Payne says this, we now live in a time when the church thinks of itself as doing missions, even if the gospel is never shared. Now, that is absolutely prophetic. And people want to argue with us about the word mission and missionary. Frankly, I I don't want to argue over the word when Jesus has made it abundantly clear without using the word missionary, that we are called to make disciples of all nations. And I think we now do missions and we call it that even when the gospel is never shared. Matt Ellison and Denny Spitters return to defend why every Christian isn't a missionary and how we're supposed to live if that is true today on the show. But first, a special message. If you're a regular listener to this show, we wanted to say thank you. Without the Lord's help and without you, we wouldn't still be doing this. But we also want you to know that this show wouldn't exist if it weren't for ABWE International and ABWE missionaries like Justin who's a missionary in a Muslim country in Asia. So let me tell you about him. One day, he was wandering a crowded street doing street evangelism. He'd been doing it every morning for nine months with no results. He was discouraged. He sat down at an outdoor coffee shop. Local men crowded the table, fraternizing before the start of the workday. Justin tried to start a spiritual conversation with the Muslim man seated next to him, and the man, disinterested, walked off. But before Justin could even process the rejection, he heard a voice speaking to him in broken English. The voice said, you said sins forgiven, how? It was another Muslim man who had been sitting next to him who was listening silently the whole time. Justin, knowing the dangers of doing evangelism openly in this country, started to whisper to him about Jesus. They crept closer and closer until they were inches apart. They were looking around for danger the whole time. Justin whispered the gospel into this man's ear. And the man grabbed him by the shoulders, pushed him back and said, many of us want to know this message, but we're not allowed to ask. That's what life is like in a country where evangelism is illegal, and more than 130 ABWE workers like Justin are serving in places like this. Every gift to ABWE's Global Gospel Fund goes to critical staffing, support, training, and services to advance the gospel to the lost and unreached through faithful workers like Justin. So learn more and become a partner with ABWE at abwe.org slash partner. That's abwe.org slash partner. Welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Cookman, Director of Advancement and Communications with ABWE, joined by my friend Scott Dunford, pastor of Redeemer Church in Fremont, California, and he does some ABWE stuff on the side. There you go, Scott. I'm trying to simplify and shorten your introduction there a little bit. I like it. And we've been doing this a while, actually, and the intro has changed over the years. We're coming up on 200 episodes later this year, actually, which is exciting. But the reason that I mention that is because, man, going back into the archives, thinking historically, you know, ancient history, 2018, um, when we were just two <laughs> good old boys just trying out a podcast, talking about missions and talking about theology and those sorts of things. Uh, we had some guests on, didn't we? And they wrote a book that influenced us. Uh, But we want to reset that conversation today. Right, Scott? Yeah, it's great to have Denny Spitters and Matthew Ellison back with us. They wrote the book, When Everything is Missions. Um, Both of them have a lot of experience in local church and ministry. Uh, Matthew is the the president of 1615, and maybe he can talk about that a little bit more at the end of the show, uh, church missions coaching. And Denny has been serving with pioneers for many, many years, uh, veteran missionary and, and missionary leader and uh, Vice President of Church Partnerships for Pioneers USA, unless something's changed since we last talked. And uh, we're so glad to have you guys back on the show. Welcome. Uh, how, how are things going for you guys? Are you down in Florida soaking up the sunshine or or some part, some remote place uh, somewhere else in the world? No, 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 no. Yeah, definitely in Orlando here. Um, yeah, the sun is out as it is many days. And uh, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful day. Um, about 85 degrees today. So wherever you're at, um, that's what you get to compare to. And I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I'm in the high desert 
and we're not quite 85. We're probably high 70s. It's beautiful here as well. <laughs> Scott was just here in Pennsylvania with me last week, and uh, yesterday it was 80 something, which was uh, you know a little bit unseasonably warm. So I I can kind of feel the way you guys are feeling. Last week it snowed just out of nowhere, just this freak snow. Um, it was wicked. It was uh, it, you realized that spiritual warfare is is a thing, and and we live in a fallen world. Um, and I was longing for the new creation at that at that at that point in time. Um, but just to tee this off, Scott, and I, I want to hear your thoughts too. But you know, on this show for years, we've been burdened honestly by some of the things that we see in mainstream missions and in kind of nonprofit parachurch ministry, cross-cultural ministry spaces. Um, and, and it has to do with this broadness, this vagueness, where we're not necessarily putting uh, scripture, the gospel, and then a, a biblical approach to missions always at the center of that. And really everything that we've been doing uh, through the show since we launched in the fall of 2017 uh, re revolves around that. And I know that's something that matters a lot to Matt and Denny as they're here today. Um, but, but Scott, um, we first had them on to talk about when everything is missions and what happens when everything is missions. <laughs> you wanting me to answer that question? I don't think I should. I, I am. Think we've got that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been five years since the book has come out and uh, it's been a couple years since we've talked about it. You've come up with a new book called conversations on when everything is missions. And I'm, I'm curious What's been the reaction? Um, I know that people are talking about it because I see who you've got listed on your on your uh, on the the new book who's, who are writing about it. And I know it's been a constant conversation piece, even in my doctoral classes uh, that I've been taking at Midwestern in missiology. This topic was probably the most controversial thing that we talked about mm. of, of, of even defining what is missions and who is a missionary. So, um, what from your from your guys's perspective, what's been the reaction? How about you go first, Denny? Sure, sure. Uh, so, um, you know, we've had some great conversations with others about this. You know, we find that obviously that some of this is kind of preaching to the choir in the essence that it's reminding people, hey, this is a significant um, and important thing uh, to define mission very well and clearly and know what it means. And on the other hand, we've We've had some, I'd say, limited pushback to some extent. Um, mostly, it's got people kind of talking and thinking about it, which was our aim at the beginning. We believe very strongly that the church, both Matthew and I have served in, in multiple churches and in served in coming along church, alongside churches and encouraging them. And we believe wholeheartedly that the church does not do missions well because it doesn't think about missions very well. Yeah. What about you, Matthew? Uh, so the response to the book has been very encouraging. Uh, I believe about 15,000 units are out there right now. And we've gotten feedback from people who've read it and said, wow, this is exactly what I was thinking, but you put all the language together in such a way that it really resonated with me. And then I would say that other readers have been provoked and it's created some disequilibrium. And, and that's really what we were hoping the book would do. It was it would create tension in the hearts and the minds of readers, and they would then appraise whether or not their understanding of missions is shaped by the Bible or shaped by something else. I think of one pastor in particular, uh, Denny knows the story. We're, we were at an event in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we were conversing with this pastor, and he immediately pushed back on this idea that not everyone was a missionary because lo and behold, and no surprise, he'd been telling his congregation, you're all missionaries for years. And so he was really rattled by this idea that this was not a biblical concept. And uh, we had the opportunity to meet with him the following day. And he had read our book. He devoured it that night. And he goes, you know what? I'm convinced. Hmm. He said, um, I've been calling everyone a missionary, but I didn't really mean it. He hmm. said, I've read your book now. Hmm. And what I hmm. meant was everyone's a witness Everyone should be an evangelist, but not everyone is a missionary with this sent out apostolic calling. And so, you know, what's the response been? I think the usual suspects have just soaked it up and they're using it to help their missions teams and others think well about missions. But it, it's, had, it's had a provocative effect as well. What's something that surprised you in some of the responses? Um, have there been people that haven't latched onto it that have been 
really vocal in in saying no everyone every believer is a missionary and here's why or or have there been other responses things that you didn't expect in response to the book in response to that central concept which for for those of our listeners not overly familiar with the first book i mean the premise is hey if everything that christians do is missions then nothing is i mean that's what we're talking about here what surprised you in the response to that one of the bigger surprises has been the people that are vociferously opposed uh, tend to take shots through social media rather than engage in the process. It's very, ref- uh, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. It's very reflective of the way that we now communicate, mm. which is pretty unhealthy and very unhealthy for us in the church uh, specifically. Um, and so I think that um, often um, that people bump up against something that maybe for 20 or 30 years, as Matthew says, is, is now causing disequilibrium uh, for them, and it rattles them. And uh, so rather than engage and have a conversation about it, actually, um, it's, it's like, you know, pound it down or, or just destroy it. And, and often it's funny to watch these posts and see where people go with it. And then somebody will say, well, I, I said all this and yeah, I've never read the book. So <laughs> you, you have this kind of opposing yeah. views of this that have been set up in the last 20 to 50 years by missiologists with a lot of deconstruction around let's rethink missions. Let's rethink. And it, there's a constant call. One of, one of the best chapters in our new book is a chapter by Ted Essler of Missio Nexus, and it's about um, deconstruction. And he says, uh, he, he calls it deconstructing the Great Commission, and that there is a, this constant hmm. call for rethinking missions that just does not die. And historically, when we look backwards and see the results of these rethinkings, they're extremely negative and have a negative impact on people's attitudes and outlook on what mission really is. Mm. Can you explain that a little bit more? What are some of those ways that it's been negative? I think that, uh, you know, if you go all the way back to... um, The Edinburgh Conference, after the Edinburgh Conference, you know, a major, um, he cites a a major study that was put out by John R. Mott with John Rockefeller funding it. And basically, uh, the call of the end of that was to rethink the whole paradigm of missions at that point. Well, if you know anything historically about what was happening in missions, there was probably the greatest thrust of mission movement in the world to the unreached that was happening as never before at the turn of the 19th century. And this had a very chilling effect and took many of the denominations that we would call conciliar denominations. And for those of you, just the high ranking, let's say not denominations of Presbyterianism, Lutheranism, etc. And it took them down a path of the social gospel with a rejection of the actual gospel itself. And that's that's a huge shift. So there are lots of times when this rethinking um, really becomes a deconstruction, which we love right now in the social fabric. Of, a, of America. And it's, it's really unhealthy. Just deconstruction leads to chaos. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not really helpful. Yeah, I've got a couple quotes here from Ted Esler's chapter. And um, there's a few things where maybe like I would disagree with with Ted Esler on on movements issues and things like that. I think what he says here in this chapter is pretty helpful. Because even just in our marketing, our mobilizing lingo, when we talk about missions, yeah, there's such a temptation to say, we've got to reimagine the Great Commission, all these sorts of things. And no, scripture is sufficient. The marching orders are pretty clear. Uh, he says today there's almost a constant call for 
re-envisioning of missions. I'm, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Missions pastors of large churches tend to view missionaries as ineffective and believe that traditional missionaries needs a significant uh, overhaul in their approach. Uh, and then he also says what started out as an assessment of missionary work, uh, talking specifically about the Mott and the Rockefeller study, turned into a redefining of the missionary task itself that ultimately led to its uh, demise. And he concludes the chapter by saying, does the Great Commission really need to be rethought? Perhaps better, it needs rediscovery by a new generation, right? We just heard about that Barna study yeah. a year or so ago that most people haven't heard of the Great Commission who would uh, claim to be evangelical, consistent churchgoers, all those sorts of things. Um, Matt, I know you want to hop in too. Yeah, I think it's important to know that Ted just published a book on uh, innovation. So he, he's very much an innovative thinker. You know, we should apply creativity and um, critical thinking. These are important things. But as you mentioned, what he hits on is we don't need to reimagine missions or the Great Commission. We really need to rediscover it. And, and I've been thinking about this lately. If, if we want to be radical in our missions thinking, and radical, by the way, is, is a math term and it means root, we need to get back to the root. And, and so if we want to be the prevailing thought today is everyone's a missionary and everything done in Jesus name, every good evangelistic, altruistic work is a missions work. If you want to be radical, then go backwards, go back to the beginning and get to the root of what the scripture says about missions. So, um, yeah, that, that's kind of a thought I've been thinking about in this whole design mm. thinking innovation era. And again, there's some really good pieces to it. I think something else I want to bring out here is that the Woodbury study, which was done, I want to say in the 90s, I, I always mix up my dates here, but, uh, you know, the Woodbury study w was pretty ex expansive. Um, you know, he's, he's an anthropologist and he did read familiarize our, our, our listeners with that. Yeah. Um, he is an anthropologist, but, but the Woodbury study was done and what, what it revealed. And again, it was expansive. He, he's a really sound researcher. And that is the places where the gospel was proclaimed, where that was the primary aim. Those are the places that saw the biggest social transformation and, you know, the critics uh, of missions, again, those who want to deconstruct and rethink, were saying, hey, these colonials have ruined the world. Missionaries have destroyed culture. And his study revealed exactly the opposite. Right. And again, the missionaries that saw the greatest transformation with social ills and, you know, um, inequalities and things like that in culture were the ones that were primarily focused on our ancient message and our ancient mission which is the proclamation of the gospel. You know, I, I, I can't let this go. So I'm, I'm just going to dive in here. I'm, I'm pretty charged up about this, obviously. But this, this is very fundamental to something that's absolutely critical when we talk about mission. And that is the whole concept of doing mission without gospel. Probably the one of the greatest statements in our second book, and there's some great people that write in here from, you know, Ed Stetzer, David Platt. I think J.D. Payne's opening um, paragraph at the end has a crystal clear statement that says this. We now live in a time when the church thinks of itself as doing missions even if the gospel is never shared. Now, that is absolutely mm -hmm. prophetic and prescient, and it cuts to the core. People want to argue with us about yeah. the word mission and missionary. You know, frankly, I, I don't want to argue over the word. I don't see how we're going to lose the words because everybody that wants to redefine and deconstruct it comes up with things that are just as pejorative in terms of how they sound and their meaning over time. Oh, it's colonialistic, et cetera. Well, you come up with the new pilgrims. Well, gee, you know, <laughs> so why are we spending all this time doing this when Jesus has made it abundantly clear without using the word missionary that we are called to make disciples of all nations. His five commissioning statements make it clear. And I think J.D. Payne nails it. We now do missions, when, and, and it's missions, and we call it that, when, even when the gospel 
is never shared. That, mm. that to me is the core of this issue more than anything else. That's the issue. You kind of set it up well. You know, you've got this follow up conversations about when everything is missions. Um, you've already listed some some of the contributors, which are you know some heavy hitters in the missions world, either as as mobilizers or as missiologists and thinkers. So, what was the goal with the follow up? I mean, it was, were there things that were left out, or was it just simply taking the conversation uh, further down the road? Matthew, yeah, book two is a bit of a divine serendipity, if I can use that terminology there. We didn't plan on writing book two. What what happened was the editor of Frontier Missions Frontiers, Rick Wood, reached out to us, and they do the publication about six times a year. They're part of Frontier Ventures. Most of our listeners are probably familiar with that publication. And Rick Wood had read book one, and he said, I absolutely resonated with the hypothesis of your book. And he said, for 10 years, I've been wanting to do an issue of Missions Frontiers magazine on this idea that everyone's a missionary and, you know, the implications of that idea. And so he said, guys, um, you basically have editorial license. And so Denny and I put our heads together. We said, look, why don't we pull in some other thinkers, some missions practitioners and leading thinkers? And we assembled about 10 of them and turned out to be a great issue. And then Denny and I were reading the magazine. So no one can see my magazine that I'm putting up here right here, but you guys can. Um, Danny and I read through the magazine and we're like, Hey, we have book number two. It already exists. It's been written for us. And so we added probably about six other authors to the conversation. I I would say one of the things that we really love about book two is that it extended the dialogue beyond Danny and I. And one of the criticisms we received from book one is that we didn't have scientific data and research behind our hypothesis. Of course, you already mentioned that the the Barna study that revealed that the church is very confused about the Great Commission. In fact, that's how we open up book two. We said we read, we wrote book one. We had pushback from some people who read the manuscripts and said, hey, we like the book, but this is really your experience. And then lo and behold, the seed company in partnership with Barna reveals that the church is greatly confused about the Great Commission. About half the church doesn't even know what the Great Commission is. And so Book two had some reflex benefits in that regard, too, because it allowed us to draw the Barna study into book two. And then it allowed us to say, we're not the only ones that have these convictions. In fact, a lot of folks in the missions world, you know, have the same passions we do about this topic. Mm. We want to be clear. We're not quibbling here about uh, words to to no avail, right? The, these definitions matter, right? And we think we agree with you guys that there are big consequences that if we don't get the definitions right, we can end up doing great harm uh, as a church and as missions thinkers and practitioners. We'll talk about that more in just a moment with Matt Ellison and Denny Spitters. Hey, listeners, want to meet us? Well, we'd love to meet you. And if you're hungering for a deep, no-fluff missions conference, keep listening. The Radius Missiology Conference is happening June 23rd and 24th at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis. The theme this year, Acts, the Gospel Proclaimed Through the Church. Hear from John Piper, Mark Dever, Brooks Buser, Chad Vegas, and more. Now, Scott and myself will be there in person, live, recording, interviewing speakers, and enjoying the fellowship. If you're like us, it's probably been a while since you've been to a conference, so get out of the house and come and enter our drawing to attend for free. That's right, free. Simply go to missionspodcast.com slash RMC for details, and we'll see you there this June at the Radius Missiology Conference. Hi, I'm Scott Dunford, and I'd like to share with you about a new nonprofit ministry established to help churches, Christian schools, and other ministries protect children and prevent abuse. Rich Hamar from Church Law and Tax states that the number one reason that drives churches to court is child sexual abuse. I can't think of anything more devastating to these lives, their families, and our witness before a watching world than sexual abuse that takes place in ministry. The traumatic impact often leaves the vulnerable not wanting anything to do with God or his people. Our efforts toward evangelism, discipleship, and spiritual 
spiritual formation are not only neutralized, but shattered. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention was formed to help ministry leaders understand the complexities of child protection and abuse prevention. They are establishing standards and an accreditation program that will help verify that appropriate measures are in place at your church or ministry. Learn more about them. Find a helpful and free assessment tool to help you see how you measure up in this area. Go to abuseprevention.org and click on the link for this resource assessment. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention. And this June, attend the National Conference. Go to abuseprevention.org and register with ABWE21 as the promo code to receive 20% off your ticket. That's promo code ABWE21 to receive 20% off. We're back with our friends, Matt Ellison and Denny Spitters, talking about the follow-up to their book. First book was When Everything is Missions. The second book is Conversations on When Everything is Missions, uh, with some great contributors to that. We want to dive in a little bit deeper here to some of these definitions. So we, we would agree on this show, not everyone is a missionary. Yes, everyone is to be an evangelist a witness, uh, to some extent, a disciple maker, right? Whatever that looks like specifically. Uh, but not everyone is a sent missionary, uh, ordained, called into, into gospel work by, by a local church and by spiritual authority. We, we agree on some of those things, but walk this out for us. So what is it that you guys have seen as the ill consequences of this that you're trying to address in this second book, as well as the first one? What are the consequences that you're seeing firsthand you know, what, what is the actual fruit of if we get this wrong? Because I think somebody could look at this pretty cynically from the outside and say, oh, the worst case scenario is somebody thinks they're, they're a missionary and they live on mission. Um, is it really that big of a deal? Yeah, I want to mention something before I answer that question. And, and that is the idea that everyone's a missionary is well-intentioned. I, I, I don't think it has malice behind it. I, I think that those who have used that terminology are trying to motivate the people of God to be more active in sharing their faith. That's what they're hoping to accomplish. But it, it really has the opposite effect. I think it's a demotivator. And, and I would say the biggest consequence is that the priority of taking the gospel cross-culturally and especially to the unreach gets obscured, um, if not totally forgotten. Because if everyone's a missionary— then, you know, everything done in Jesus name is mission. Then the only difference between Algeria and Alabama is geography. And, and you know, that's not true. It's about gospel access. So I, I know that Denny's heartbeat and mine, our, our biggest issue with the confusion is that those who lose when we call everyone a missionary and everything missions are the unreached. In fact, th there's an article that was written by Rick Wood and he said, if you want to keep the unreached unreached, just keep calling everyone a missionary. Mm. That to me is, is the biggest implication, but there's more. Denny, you want to sound in on that as well? Yeah, I think it has a significant impact on our local churches. We think that this whole conversation, it only has to do with this missionary thing and sending people. It doesn't. At its core is the issue of what real discipleship is. We have so wandered off the path of what that means that we now are calling and trying to find terms that will help people do things. Well, we will motivate people if we call everything missional, which it, Ed Stetzer says is very little more than an ink blot kind of Rorschach test and people choose what they want and maybe don't really get what they need. Right. So we 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 don't really truly disciple people. In fact, missions is not a part of discipleship. If there is discipleship in our church, that's separate. That's like for people way down the road. I mean, this is so uh, foreign to the gospel, it, the gospels themselves, that it's incredible. And I think you know, um, when we lost it, we, we lost it by trying to de define all of these things and call everybody something to motivate them to do something. I mean, often we're asked, well, then what do we call people? I'm like, well, what Jesus calls us, we're disciples. You know, I, I mean, think of it this way. All those called apostles or sent ones were disciples, but not all disciples 
were given the calling and the title and the role of being apostles. That can be applied to any other role in the church. And Paul really emphasizes this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 by coming alongside and gives the body itself as an example of how we're not all the same. So people have different roles, and the calling of a missionary is one to take the gospel where it is not and to uh, be that leading edge. It's the Romans 10. Who, who's going to go? How are they going to know unless someone is sent? And how are they going to hear unless there's a preacher or a proclaimer or one who is sharing the gospel? So those are just a few of the things. And, you know, we could sit here and talk about all of the, you know, kind of logical things. Well, is everybody a pastor because they do some care of other? Well, of course not. We don't call everybody a pastor. Uh, and you could go right down the line. Well, is is everybody a um, a doctor if they have medical training? No, no they have to have a Facebook account. Well, That's what makes them a doctor. A rescue swimmer because you know in the Coast Guard because they can swim. Absolutely not. So you know, we just really feel like let's get back to the basics. Let's look at the gospel straight up. And let's take all that we're hearing from missiologists and all the deconstruction and be and, and take that with a very, very careful filter. And that filter should be that the gospel itself is the center of missions, period. And when we lose that, we lose our mission. And that's where the church is at today. Quick follow up with a phrase that you uh, mentioned earlier before we get into the future and where is contemporary missions and missiology going. But the follow up is why do we have this need to call everybody a something? Um, Do you think and I'm kind of spitballing, but is that just the overflow of our individualism, of our expressive individualistic mindset of this kind of uh, American sort of volunteeristic, everyone, you know, can do something, everybody's a hero, uh, kind of a mentality where we feel like a title like Christian, um, (laughs) you know, child of God, uh, member of the body, disciple, that those aren't enough that somebody also needs, you know, to, to be given additional rank and title even if they're just a member of, for lack of a better term, the laity, that we want to take an office like pastor or missionary and take something like that and bestow that um, on everyone. Because the, the reason I ask that is I think it's exhausting. I think that a pastor or a, mission, a ministry leader that leads this way is going to exhaust the people under their care at some point, because not everyone is a, a goer and a doer to the same extent, because in the body of Christ, you have feet. And the feet are beautiful. You mentioned Romans 10. You also have thumbs and you also have earlobes and you have all sorts. And that's the beauty. And Scott, you feel this as a pastor. Like that's the beauty of body life is that there's some members of the body that don't seem like they're making as big a splash. And yet that's where I think Christ gets such glory from every member of the body uh, behaving differently. So why why do we feel the need to, to talk people up rather than just using some of those biblical descriptors? Well, Denny already hit on it, but I'm going to repeat it because it's worth repeating. We have so lowered our standards for what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ that that now what should be the work of every disciple, which is sharing your faith, feeding empty bellies, caring for orphans and widows. This is the normal work of disciples. In order to get disciples to do that work, we have to call the missionaries. So, you know, Mm -hmm. they're not acting like disciples. Let's call the missionaries so that they'll do the work of a disciple And Denny and I have talked about this many times. If you're not behaving like a disciple, if Christ is not your treasure, if you don't understand what it means to be a part of his purposes in the world, if that's not important to you, suddenly calling this person a missionary is not going to change their behavior. In Mm -hmm. fact, I believe it's a demotivator, right? Um, So to me, that's the biggest issue here. We have lost our understanding of what it means to be a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. We should be in awe of that, that he has forgiven us, redeemed us, that we have a place in him and a place in his plan. But that doesn't matter to us. 
So uh, let's call people missionaries to get them activated and motivated. But again, th- there's major complications and major implications here. Um, l- let me insert something here that I think needs to be said. And that is w- when those who are advocates for saying everyone's a missionary, they're saying it's not helpful because if you tell people they're, they're not missionaries, you know, they're not going to be motivated. That's what they say, right? Um, and, and I think what we need to mention here is no one's off the hook. And we're not saying missionaries are, you know, higher on the scale that, you know, that they're these super spiritual people. You guys know this. They're broken people just like us. And so it's not a rank. It's a role. And so when we say not everyone's a missionary, don't get the idea that suddenly, oh, I'm off the hook. Everyone has a role to play in the mission of God. And in fact, when we don't when we don't have a distinct understanding of what a missionary is, one of the things we do is we deprive the sender of his role as well. Um, in, in third John, we read what makes a godly old saint happy. And, and John commends Gaius for his care of these itinerant missionaries. And he says, you will do well to speed them on their journey in a manner worthy of God's name for they have gone out among the Gentiles accepting nothing for the sake of Jesus's name. And so he elevates the importance of caring for missionaries as high as it can possibly be elevated. So again, we need to recapture what it means to be a disciple. And then within that, with, you know, we're discipled into a global context. What is my role inside of that larger picture? So I just want people to be clear if they're hearing this, everyone has a role to play and goers are celebrated in the Bible. And so are senders. They're celebrated. And in third John, they're celebrated so that they may be fellow workers for the truth. So yeah, the, yeah, the, there's a there's a parody there. Go ahead, Denny. Well, well, I think David Platt says it this simply. I think the title of his chapter in the book is "We Are Not All Missionaries, but We Are All on Mission," and I think that in a phrase kind of says it all. So you know, at perspectives, um, lesson fifteen is the whole idea of what, here's the nine practices uh, that a true disciple will practice in while being on mission, let's say. And I've often heard it, well, you pick one of these. What? No, <laughs> we're called to do all of them. We don't get to kind of pick or choose. And this goes back to your original part of your question. Americans, American culture says we have we get to choose what we want and pick out of the bible and pull from it and pick from what jesus says about what a true disciple is we get to pull from it whatever we want and appropriate it to our own lives our egalitarian individualism has so become has become so narcissistic that that's how we often view the bible and I'm sorry. It, it, it's not helpful at all to approach the Bible that way. And Jesus makes it abundantly clear that it's not possible for us to think like that and become a part of the kingdom. It's all or nothing. We take everything he says and we do it, or we, we can't just pick and choose. And that's what I find to be most interesting about the whole kind of picture about surrounding this kind of, you know, oh, it's just, um, this is just, you, it's mm. semantics. That's all it is. Well, you know what? I, I think it's pretty clear. Just take the five commissioning statements of Jesus. And, you know, we talk about the Great Commission. That, you know, the Bible doesn't define Matthew 28 as the Great Commission, but you take all five commissioning statements post-resurrection of Christ that he gives to his disciples and to us as the church, it is very clear what our mission is. Why don't we do it? Why why are we not engaged in it? That's the question that we have and that we want to bring forward in the book as people wrestle with, you know, all of these uh, different ideas of terms and what they mean. Well, as we wrap up today, thank you guys for joining the show. I think this is helpful and a continuing conversation we need to have. Um, How can people find out more about you, about Pioneers, about 1615, and find a a way to get a hold of the book? Uh, Let you go first, Denny, then you, Matthew. 
Sure. Uh, you know, if people are interested in learning more, um, you know, they can go to our website. Matthew and I have a website called whenEverythingIsMissions.com. Um, all of the books are there, um, the podcasts. Um, if they're interested in learning more uh, or want a book, that's probably actually the best way to, to get the books. I think there are even uh, compendiums put together where you can buy books, you know, together at a reduced price. And um, our goal is is to really encourage people to get the information and think about it. Uh, if they want to reach me or want to learn more actually about Pioneers, I loved how this show opened. That story of the guy sharing the gospel in an unreached place was was incredible. And I'm like, sign me up, you know. Uh, if you want to learn more about Pioneers, simply go to pioneers.org. Uh, if you're a church and you want to learn more about how you can engage more directly, there's a tab for churches. And, um, you know, if you want to contact me personally, um, you know, you, you can find out actually on there and, and, and connect with me. I'm, I'm glad to connect and encourage any churches we can, any leaders we can. Yeah, I, I want to uh, mention the the Woodbury study, which I surfaced earlier before I talk about 1615, if I can, because I totally blew it. Um, I, I have some cold medicine in my head right now, and so <laughs> I'm not firing quite like I normally do. Uh, the Woodbury study was done in 2012, and it's called The Missionary Roots of Liberal Democracy. You can look it up on Google. It's a fascinating study. And, and what he reveals once again is that the missionaries that saw the greatest transformation were the proselytizing missionaries that focused on the proclamation of the gospel and the planting of churches. That missionaries, in fact, do not destroy culture, but historically we see that God uses them to beautify culture. So I want to mention that because I think it's an important read. Uh, 1615, you can visit us at 1615.org. And there's just a, a bevy of resources. I like that word, bevy. Um, on our website, we have webinars, we have podcasts, there's books. And again, if you're a church that is wanting to clarify its global mission, if you're needing help with vision and strategy, that's exactly what we do. We are not a missionary sending organization. We help churches to clarify vision and strategy. Very good. We're so glad you guys were able to join us again on the show. Matt Ellison and Denny Spitters, and they are the authors of Conversations on When Everything is Missions. We'll include a link for that in the show notes. Please share this show with a friend. Maybe there's somebody that you know that's been not <laughs> biblically informed on some of these issues, and we want to spread the word. Uh, have them go to missionspodcast.com, share this episode, and while you're at it, leave us a positive rating and a five-star review in your app of choice. And until next time, thank you for listening.